it's the 25th anniversary and I think the first thing that I want to ask after watching that is how does it feel for you looking at it 25 years on? Uh, it's really pretty rewarding actually because I always say like it's good to make the film you wanted to make <laughs> and that film came from something that um, I felt like passionate about the subject matter and also um, you know basically getting a little backstory of the film because uh, I wasn't seeing like I said in the opening I wasn't seeing really images about black women in feature films at that time so uh, it was important for me to just kind of start from scratch so <laughs> I said I had an idea and I didn't know anybody in the industry uh, my first grant like uh, I did was for uh, I got for hundred and fifty dollars from the Brooklyn Arts Council and people would say you're making a film for hundred and fifty dollars <laughs> you're going to make a feature, but it gave me a track record, and uh, for, and we went through a lot of obstacles. You know, it's very hard to make, a, it, challenging to make a film. Uh, we shot like a trailer to show, to, to submit to people to see, and I remember we shot the film, a, a trailer on the subway, and we had actors, and it was a weekend. I used to um, work, uh, I worked in advertising, and then it just became overwhelming, that job. And I quit, but I had still had to pay the rent, so I worked a nine to five as a temp. And then I would go down, <laughs> take the subway, the IRT, down to an arts organization called Film Video Arts. And I would get access to equipment in exchange uh, for working there. And then we shot a film, uh, the sample, on the weekends just to get raised money. And I shot it in, uh, the sample was in black and white, and <laughs> we shot it, and at that time I was using film. And I went to a lab, and it was like a fledgling lab. It wasn't a lab, it was a lab I could afford. And I remember I, after my nine to five job, I ran down there and I said, oh, uh, when I got down there, they said, oh, we developed your black and white film in the color bath. So everything was ruined. Oh, <laughs> and so we I had to start over with friends and family, and they did, and then when, we, when I had the script, I submitted it to some studios, mini studios, and they, I got a phone call, and they said, oh, we love the script, it's one of the best we've read, uh, but we have some bad news too, well, can you make Tyrone a drug dealer? And I said, no, but if you have to kind of remember the climate, the climate back then was juice, yeah. uh, uh, st uh, straight out of Brooklyn, uh, Boys, you know, Boys in the Hood it had a lot to do with that culture. And so this film was kind of different. So I'm, I'm, when you ask how I feel now, I feel very um, satisfied and just satisfied that the audience loves it. Yeah. And so we get good reaction from that. I think it's incredible because it's, it feels like a film that really stands up to time. And I think that's what's really brilliant about it is the way the female voice is so strong throughout both um, with Chantal as someone who's defiant and won't be told what to think, who she can be, and you know how to behave, so the respectability politics of that. And so how conscious were you in constructing the story that it would be uh, you know, very much like a female story, like you said, at a time when actually you've got Boys in the Hood and all of these stories that really are about black men, but not black women. Yeah, and I think it was the you know time for all films then. It was very much male oriented at that yeah. time. Uh, my my kind of idea was to hear female voices because I felt female voices weren't being heard, and I also wanted to make the film very entertaining as well. <laughs> so that was a challenge on both ends. Uh, Blake breaking the fourth wall, where Chantel actually talks to the camera was a stylistic approach that I really wanted to put in there. Um, I grew up on like loving foreign films. I grew up in Ohio and um, my br in the inner city and I had two older brothers and they loved movies. Like they loved all these foreign movies. We had reel to reels, we had pneumatics, we had VHS tape of foreign films. And I always, in those type of films, like in Jean-Luc Godard, for example, a lot of it is breaking the fourth wall. Yeah. So that came from kind of like I didn't even know it at the time, but it came from something that was in me. Um, my mother loved all the Hollywood movies with like Dorothy Dandridge and Betty Davis and Jean Harlow. <laughs> so I used to come home from school and watch fil those films with her. Yeah. Uh, and so that kind of influenced me when the film was reviewed in the New York Times. 
uh, the late Vincent Camby, who was a reviewer there, said, and he wrote in the, the uh, review that Chantel rem reminded him of Jean Harlow. So that was kind of like, oh, okay, that came from something that yeah. uh, came from my kind of love for movies. The fact that the young woman is defiant and she's not like an appendage to the guy. She's not the sister. At that time, a lot of the black women on feature films were the sister, the mother, the girlfriend. And I wanted an appendage to the guy. To, and I wanted her to have her own voice. And so even through the music, um, you know, Angie Stone did a wonderful job <laughs> uh, to do the soundtrack, Mixed yeah. Up World. and. Eric Sadler, who is the, um, I put together, he's the music composer. He worked with NWA, and he worked with Janet Jackson, met Madonna. I didn't know him, but Brooklyn at that time was a very uh, cultural place. And Spike was there, uh, Branford Marsalis, Little Kim, Eric Badu, where we were all in kind of Brooklyn. So I didn't know Eric, but he came over to my apartment, we, I had a flatbed, the old fashioned <laughs> editing. I had to put that in my apartment. Yeah. And we ran out of money after shooting the film. Uh, and he came over and said, you know, what do you want for the soundtrack? So that's all original music. Susan Vega gave us rights to use, like for Daddy's Little Girl and yeah. um, Nikki D. So we had a lot of like the strong female voices. And at that time, you know, you had like Yo-Yo. I think people, are, I'll date myself, <laughs> Queen Latifah, you know. Uh, so we had a lot of, uh, I think, strong women in music. And I wasn't seeing that in, on the screen. So that's why I wanted to have like a female soundtrack. I also wanted Chantel to be a complex character. And I, I do that for all my characters, yeah. regardless of genre, I mean, regardless of uh, gender, or I just feel that uh, she, I wanted her to be flawed too. Not just the good girl, not just the bad girl, but a human being with problems, you know, with ambitions, with emotion. And, at, and you know, a lot of films I would see at that time about teenagers, they all seem to be older <laughs> than what they were. Yeah. And I wanted to make a young teenager seem, a teenager seem like she's processing things the way a teenager would process. And, you know, we were talking about the um, girls on the park bench. Yeah. Because that actually came from, I do a lot of research when I write, so that came from research. I went to Planned Parenthood, Brooklyn Teen Pregnancy Center. I interviewed counselors. I interviewed teenagers, not just women, but men also, young, young teenagers, who had gone through uh, pregnancy, teen pregnancy. And a lot of the myths that they talk about on the park bitch came from my research. OK, so there were actual real voices that are then reflected in those of the characters. Um, you talk about all of the research and that whole process of getting you know, the film to what it was, but once you'd made it, what, what did you do next? How, how experienced were you? You'd, you'd self-financed to, to a large degree and used your own sort of time to make it. So then how did you make it, how did you manage to get into Sundance? How did it suddenly become part of this huge canon of film that we now sort of recognize? Well, you know, at that time the independent film uh, era was kind of really hot then. So that helped that people were creating their own films. Yeah. They were taking their own companies and uh, uh, just getting out there and shooting and raising money. And so I had gotten from the $150 grant, <laughs> I got, uh, it gave me a track record. So I received grants from American Film Institute, AFI, got the Filmmakers Award for that, yeah. um, National Endowment for the Arts, Jerome. So I put together, and you know, it's also a team effort, filmmaking. Um, we had a great team of people. Arion is fantastic. Yeah. Arion Johnson, who plays Chantel, is fantastic in this. Uh, we, people galvanized around us. Um, I always tell <laughs> this story because sometimes we don't hear about the obstacles that filmmakers really have. Uh, we were shooting, we shot the film in 17 days. 17 days. Yes. And we, uh, we were, I remember one day we were uh, going to the Brooklyn Bridge and that's the scene where Chantel uh, tells Tyrone that she's pregnant. So we had shot so many scenes that day. I had a magic hour shot that I had really designed and I wanted to look well on the Brooklyn Bridge. So by the time we got over there, first of all, there was a commercial being shot there at our location. 
And the commercial had the uh, they had Winnebago's big trailers. Uh, they had top shelf equipment. Uh, they even had a Broadway star. And we were like we had our little camera trying to do this movie. And when we finally set up after a long day of shooting, my DP had his eye to the view uh, eyepiece, and he looked up. He said, "Leslie, it's pitch black. I can't see a thing. How are we going to shoot this?" And I was like, "Oh no! What are we going to do? This was a really important scene." And the commercial next to us, they turned their HMI huge light <laughs> over to our production. Yeah. And that's how we got that shot off the ground. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> and so with Sundance, you know, that just came about because people heard about the movie. They read, you know, and uh, it got kind of buzz. And, uh, you know, we kind of, uh, we went to Toronto. We were official selection in Toronto, in Deauville, in Tokyo. Um, and, uh, you know, we went to 20 countries. So. Yeah, you had a huge impact. And then you sort of also got distribution. From Miramax, Miramax, you sold the film. And so how did that, how did that come about? Was that also just a vir by virtue of it being so incredibly popular? Because I think I'm interested to know, because mm -hmm. I think often then, and even still now, what we talk about is the commercial viability of black female leads, black filmmakers, or, you know, film that is produced by people of color, especially women of color. And what you there, you know, what you showed 25 years ago is that you could do that and navigate that really successfully. Mm -hmm. And I think that feel like that was a change. You know, the film community is very small, <laughs> and people hear about your movie and they know when you're shooting. You know, the unions know, and everybody knows yeah. when you're like out there. Uh, and so we had little. Um, there were some journalists who wrote about the film. Oh, there's this little film being shot and. You know, uh, and actually Merrimax read that, and they kind of tracked the movie as I was going on. Uh, it wasn't an easy process, let me tell you, because even the first time we submitted the Sundance, I had to, I couldn't afford, you know, we ran out of money in production, and I couldn't afford to make even a, a copy of the movie. I had to take a little VHS camera and copy it off the flatbed, which is the editing suite. Um, yeah. it, editing machine at that time and then I submitted it to Sundance and they were saying well you know we couldn't we didn't finish it the first year I submitted it I didn't get in so they but they liked the movie and they yeah. kept on saying and that's something that if you if there are any aspiring filmmakers in the audience is you have to keep on going you, nothing can really stop you and at a certain point we shot the film in 16 in super 16 which means that you can't show it in the theater uh, it's double system, so you have to blow it up to get a 30, and you have to get a 35 millimeter print blow up. So uh, I was in it too deep <laughs> to get out, and so I had to just keep on going, and it yeah. ended up that the distributor paid for the 35 millimeter blow up, which is very expensive. So it was like once you start, you can't stop, you can't let any obstacles stop you. You just have to keep on going and uh, love, you know, really love what you do. Yeah, and then so off the back of that, you have this incredibly successful film that's really well received, both sort of critically and by audiences. And what happens next for you as a filmmaker? Like, do you do you already have something ready in waiting? Do you have writers? But what what came next for you after that? Well, I had a script right out the back <laughs> called Royalties, Rhythm and Blues about a black woman who's a hip hop executive with her husband. We couldn't get the financing, uh, and that was even though people loved the script. Uh, I, I did um, a Bessie Coleman, who was the first black, first African American to get male or female to get her international pilot's license in 1920s. And uh, I was actually after IRT, Showtime called and said, well, we have, we're celebrating Black History Month and we'd like to get you to do a movie and what would you like to do? And I said, well, Bessie Coleman. And, it was dead silence on the phone. This was in 94. They didn't know who she was. So they hung up the phone, <laughs> and they called us back. And they said, we really didn't know who she was. And so we did a period piece um, that we shot, uh, and that was really fun. You know, uh, we, the, the actress in it uh, uh, is Rhonda Ross, who's Dinah Ross's mother, I mean daughter. Yeah. And so she did, it looked, she looks so much like her <laughs> in the film. It's kind of eerie when she was doing like Lady Sings the Blues. But you know, like Rhonda 
wanted to do this movie. It was small, and she it was a short film. But she, you know, that's what I'm talking about about having a crew cast who believe in what you're doing and who will take risk and be behind. You're like a it's like going to war. It really is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I guess what we kind of I feel like we gleaned from what you just said is that even if you do make a successful film, there are some but definitely some roadblocks in terms of where that financing comes. How much do you think that's changed from you know the the context that you made the film in there to mm -hmm. now? Like, are things changing? We're having so many more conversations around authorship and who gets to tell what stories. Um, but to your mind, is is that changing? Oh yes, definitely, and that's a great thing. That and I think it's changing because people have spoken up. They've started to say, look at the industry and say, where is the diversity? Where are more men, women directors? It's definitely not perfect yet, but we're getting there slowly. And I do think that with like Dee Reeves and uh, with Ava DuVernay and you know other directors, you know Gina Prince Blythewood, Casey Lemons, we all came up like Gina and Casey came up, you know, in the '90s. And then it was really challenging for us to make another movie. And especially like when I did um, Just Another Girl, I wanted her in this is in '93. The poster, because I came from advertising, I was telling you how you can use what you, you know, no matter what job you have, you got to kind of take those skills and put it to maybe your passion yeah. projects. And I wanted to have a black woman on the poster by herself. They were like, well, we think we should have the her and the boyfriend. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't even get, a, it was really challenging to get a poster with her by herself yeah. on the poster. And so, it just and shows is that because you. they thought that people weren't going to pick it up or that it wouldn't feel like it was big enough? Like, what was their thinking? I think their thinking was that, well, we need kind of a, a male to kind of substantiate that this is, yeah. I don't know, a good film? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> or this is a film that people want to see? It's just as arbitrary as it sounds. Yeah, it was just as <laughs> crazy. Like, when you look back, and I think that now it's it really sounds crazy, right? But then that's what kind of I was facing. And I didn't really, I took it as a challenge. And even now, you know, people, I'm working on a new film, uh, I, I Love Cinema, which is a satire. And uh, even uh, when we were struggling to make IRT, we ran out of money and uh, we needed to get post-production yeah. money. And so I just, someone, had sent Terry McMillan, who did Waiting, wrote, Waiting to Exhale, Stella got a group back. I didn't know Terry at the time. She, we sent her, the, someone sent her the script, and she is, lives on the uh, West Coast, and I live on the East Coast, and she called me up like at 3 a.m. and said, I'm at the last five pages of what's going to happen with the baby and Chantel? <laughs> and she said, how much money do you, you know, can, well, I'll give you what I can. And she fed a, expressed a check so we could get post-production funds. Uh, Michael Moore. I actually saw him at one of these like functions, and I went up to him and said, I'm, I'm in post-production, can you see? <laughs> so he came to see the film on the flatbed <laughs> with no titles and scratches and all this stuff, and he liked the movie because it told the story, and he wrote out a check right there and there because he wanted to support. At that time in 93, he felt that he wasn't seeing black women he was seeing black women making movies, and he wanted to kind of support that. And he had a, like a foundation um, that he did his private, his own money. So we had gotten like a lot of um, support in that area. So you know, so my next movie, I Love Cinema, is uh, Michael's going to be in it. So we're Is just he? trying to get, and, and it's just a challenge in getting financing. Financing is tough for anybody. I don't care if you're a woman, what up, color, whatever. It's a, you know, when you ask people for money, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you all know. <laughs> it's not easy. Is there anything that you're particularly, I guess, excited about in terms of the way that the landscape has changed? I think you sort of, sort of referred to, I think when we were talking before, just about all of the various platforms now where we're like consuming media like is, is, has that changed in any way the way you're able to work and the way you're able to hopefully look at financing a film and telling more stories by more people yeah I think it's really great I mean like you have Insecure with Issa Rae I mean you have a lot of different platforms it's it's it, there's more platforms gives you more opportunity yeah uh, it's still challenging because I came from the feature area so I was out there and we were like you know, submitting my feature screenplays. And that's where kind of I wasn't getting the support. And now, you know, 
you know, we I have other platforms to go to, like Amazon yeah. and Netflix and stuff like that. So hopefully, you know, if people tweet out they enjoyed the movie, if you enjoyed it, you know, if exactly. you want to see sure. it, <laughs> another film uh, uh, that I directed and wrote, uh, you know, I think that the audience can change things, too, now because of social media. Uh, probably. Because I feel like some of the... Uh, issues that are dealt with in this film, people are still dealing with those issues about sexuality, about women, about, uh, you know, like Chantel speaking up. Uh, I actually think that a lot of young people feel that it, it, it kind of is relevant today because of that, because we're hearing about more uh, women speaking up. Oh, well, you know, because it, it, it was like I, it was from my company that I established that uh, we just kind of went out with, <laughs> we went out with signs in the neighborhood, friends and family recommendations. I did have Tracy Moore who was casting for me. Uh, it was tough. Uh, I'm doing, actually I'm making a documentary on the making of Just Another Girl on the IRT and what we went through with different actresses and it was to find the right person. Uh, Ariane came in and kind of blew us away. We knew she had something special. And I think it's because when you write a screenplay, you always want someone, an actor, to elevate it and to bring something that maybe you didn't think about. And that's the whole, like, collaborative process. It was, uh, you know, and I think with uh, Ebony, uh, who played uh, Natette, and we just had some really great people, and we became more like a family. And that was important. And I, even though I didn't have a lot of money, we always gave, we always had like really nice meals. <laughs> and that was important because uh, people would come and say, well, you know, sometimes we were asking them to work for free. And they would say, it's like, you know, when we come here, it's like Sunday dinner. So <laughs> it's really good to, I think, um, always uh, respect your crew and, and your actors because they're putting out so, so much. Yeah, I'm open to, you know, I love characters and I love movies, so I'm open to like making real characters for everyone. I also think too, when we did, it's a little story too, when we were doing, uh, we were uh, screening the film around to high schools and colleges, and we were in some of the toughest neighborhoods, <laughs> and well, I remember we were in Bed-Stuy and we were showing the film, and so the kids, the young people came in and there were some really tough young Kid, you know, teenage men, you know, coming in, and uh, they sat in back and they were like, "What's this film going to be about?" and everything. Mm -hmm. So I was like, "Oh no, goodness!" And when the <laughs> film was over, they stood up and applauded. And I said, "Why are you applauding?" And they said, "Because we didn't see, we haven't seen ourselves as heroes." Well, that's a good question because it you also have to have that whole space. You have to know about that. And coming from advertising, I had a little bit of experience with marketing. So when we were dealing with the distributor, I was very forceful. <laughs> I was like, you know, we have to um, target the black audience. We have to target the indie audience. We had to, you know, target the female audience. Um, because I was so, it, I went through so much making the movie, I was very passionate about how it was going to get out there. And I must say that if you come to the table and you really express those concerns, and if the distributor is behind you, you can kind of work that out. Like I said, we did have like a struggle with the poster, but I was insistent on that. Um, and I think that just finding the right distributor is important, like for your films. Like if anyone's a filmmaker here, you know, look and see what films kind of dovetail with your films. Um, you know, look at Variety, read Hollywood Reporter, uh, all these, uh, you know, go online and uh, look at interviews. There's so many interviews now with filmmakers who can give you insight on how to kind of work with the distributor and, and kind of listen to how they're doing it. You know, now it's about like the streaming platforms and what streaming platforms would be good for your movie. And so it's about doing your research, I think is the big issue in terms of marketing and distribution. Uh, and I found that we went to 20 countries. Uh, I, a, a Japanese woman, she was a journalist, and she said, uh, you know, I speak Japanese, I grew up in Tokyo, and I was just like Chantel. 
So, <laughs> you know, I was hard headed, nobody. And so I think that for me, cinema should transcend like cultural boundaries and it should speak to, you know, a story should speak to everyone. And so in that sense, um, traveling in other countries, you get a whole different perspective of how people perceive uh, black Americans and some good and some, you know, not so good and you have to kind of navigate that whole space. But you really feel, I feel the cinema like it's so, it's like my heart kind of thing because I grew up watching movies and I think that movies can change. You know, when you see a movie, you're walking in someone else's shoes and you're, you can experience another human being. And that's like a great gift that filmmakers have and we should kind of cherish that. <laughs> we get that, thank you for asking that question. No, the music, you know, People love the music, and thank you. And uh, we did have a soundtrack. We we didn't get the soundtrack deal that kind of went through, and it was like on at that time it, <coughs> we didn't really get the soundtrack. So we're trying to actually work on maybe releasing that soundtrack because people are, are real fans of the '90s music, and uh, hopefully we can get that out. Uh, and like I said, Eric Sadler, Angie Stone, Nikki D. They just did a fantastic job in kind of galvanizing the story, you know, and the uh, music matching the whole uh, pace and the cinematic approach that I have for the movie. So thanks for mentioning that. I appreciate it.